So today's video is on hair powder and dry shampoo. We're going to learn the history, a little bit about what some of the ingredients were, as well as how things kind of changed uh, throughout history, specifically the 18th century through to the 1940s. When we think of hair powder, we think specifically of the 18th century. And we're not going to spend tons of time on the 18th century because that could be its own video. And we really work with hair powder and pomatum a lot in our other videos. But we are going to discuss it in sort of a general overview. Hair powder and dry shampoo are basically used in one of two ways. In the 18th century, we specifically used hair powder more of a starch, just like you would starch a shirt or a collar. Starch allows the hair to have a lot of volume to stand up if you need it to stand up to do things that you couldn't do if you didn't starch it. And in order to get that starch, you would have to put pulmonum or pomade on first. And then after the pulmonum or pomade, the starch would be able to stick to it. You're able to style it in that 18th century fashion as it varied throughout the 18th century. But, you know, get it up in um, cushions or curls or get the 1770s high hairstyles. You were able to do that and you were able to do it because of powder. You know, when we think of Hairspray, well, we didn't really have hairspray in the 18th century. You know, we had pulmonums with wax, and that was supposed to help hold things. Well, in lieu of hairspray, pomade and powder really did the job to get your hair to stay where it was supposed to stay. From the 18th century through to the 1940s, it just came under different names. They tried to um, put soap in with it, you know, so they could kind of mix the fat of, like, actually washing the hair with shampoo in with the dry hair powder. It really went through a lot of different changes, but it was always there. And there was always, always an apothecary carrying it, or you could make it yourself. So you never had to worry about hair powder. It was your choice. Just like in the 18th century, you could choose to be in favor of the powder, or you could choose not to. And we see that in various paintings where some artists favored the hair powder. So we see their subjects hair powdered, where others necessarily wanted to kind of forego the powder and so we see a lot of twists and braids and we don't really see much hair powder. It pretty much stays the same throughout history. You either like hair powder or you don't like hair powder. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> you know, um, it doesn't really matter what side you're on. If you want to use it, that's fine. Now, there was a tax on hair powder and that kind of changes things. But before we get into that, let's start with what is hair powder made from? So in the 18th century, and this does change a little bit throughout history, but in the 18th century, probably like 17th and 18th century, because in the 17th century, they were wearing wigs. 18th century, you know, there was some wig wearing going on too. A lot of times they dressed their own hair with hair pieces and cushions. Um, but you would see a variety of different starches being used. Uh, wheat starch was very, very common. Um, also potato starch, uh, some corn starch, and there was fine starches and not so fine starches. So just like the various cosmetic places that the shops that you would go to, you could choose how much you wanted to pay for your powder. If you had a lot of money, you could have very finely sifted powder and it was very highly sought after. But if you didn't have that much money, you could have like a lower quality powder. And these powders, we also tend to see, you know, bone meal, orris root. And if you don't know what orris root is, orris root is a root from the iris. And great herbalists like Culpepper historically would, would, would say, well, um, orris smells like violets. And so in, you know, the, the 1600s and the 1700s, and up until the mid 1800s, we were still using orris root as a substitution for violets. Because as you know, there is no such thing as oil made from the petals of the violets. Now you have oil made from the leaf of the violet, but not the petal, and that smells differently. But in the 18th century, a lot of people felt that orris root smells like violets. Now, I personally don't think it really smells like violets, but a lot of people did back then. And so that was one way of perfuming your hair powder. Another way of perfuming it was having uh, various herbs or oils put in and you could rub the powder together and perfume it that way. If you wanted powdered roses, powdered lavender, things like that. So there were ways to dress up the hair powder and make it smell good. Um, your palmitums were always scented. So dry shampoo and hair powder can be made from a variety of ingredients. And there is no one specific recipe throughout history that everybody used. 
Although, if you would make a graph to see what the most common ingredient was, it generally was wheat starch. I just recently read a paper about General George Washington's uh, curlers in the early, in his early years of his life. And so they were doing some analysis on them. And their analysis came up with oyster shell and cannel and clay, which is very interesting because now, in, historically, bone meal, dried bones, pulverized bones, that was a thing in hair powder. And when you think about oysters, <laughs> you think, wow, that's really weird. Like, we don't really see oysters. But um, I was talking with a gentleman who sent me the article, and he said in that area, oysters were prevalent. And um, if you think about, like, what properties make up bone, it's calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate. And so if you pulverize oysters, you still get that calcium carbonate, which is very interesting. So he's still using calcium carbonate, which is a general um, type of hair powder back then. But the real question comes in about the cannel and clay. And I'm not going to go much into that because we just really don't see it. It would be messy. And you're probably saying, well, the curlers were probably made out of clay. And so that was what was discussed in the article. And they're saying, yes, they, they were, but there's actual like cannel and clay residue on these curlers. So there's a very good chance that he would have used it as his powder. And that just, that's a whole nother story. So we're not going to get into that. So don't use cannel and clay. It, it would be kind of messy. One other topic of hair powders and dry shampoos is the idea of coloring them. And in, in the 18th century, you could color them with browns and yellows and pinks and blues, all sorts of colors. We also see that coming up in the dry shampoos um, in the 1820s and then again also throughout history in the basic colors like browns and blacks and blondes. Um, we have specific recipes in 1930s as well to do this. And so that's what really happened to hair powder. It, it, because of the tax, it didn't really die off. Powder. It slowly, gradually changed into dry shampoo, regardless if it was colored or if it was not colored. So the differences in powdering from the 18th century to the 19th and 20th century Basically, in the 18th century, you were using it as hair care. That was your shampoo. That was how you get the gunk out of your hair. So not only was it styling aids for a specific fashion, but at the end of the night, if you wanted to take it down, you'd take your pins out and you would comb through it with your comb and then all the dirt and the gunk would get caught in your comb. And so it was a way of cleaning the hair. And by the 20th century, we see that dropping, that hair powder just kind of dropping and getting changed into dry shampoo, even though it's the same thing. But now we're seeing it to control grease because you aren't shampooing that much, but we still shampoo where in the 18th century, our hair powder and pomatum, that was our shampoo. So let's dig into this a little bit more and we'll kind of see how the ingredients change over time. They did do this really weird thing where they wanted to keep the hair powder alive. And so a lot of times throughout history, they do this by just changing the name of it. But they also wanted to incorporate uh, the idea of cleanliness because some people felt like, well, if you put your, your hair powder on it, it's not really cleaning your scalp, it's not cleaning your head. And so in order to pick up those people who would maybe use the powder, the dry shampoo, if it could like clean your head a bit better with the idea of soap, they would powder soap in the dry uh, shampoo. And so we kind of see uh, the, the idea of it still being a cleaning product, but now we're getting soaps powdered into it instead of like actually rinsing your head under the water. There was a powder tax in 1786, and this is what slowly started to decline people from using so much hair powder. And when I say so much hair powder, one person would go through pounds of hair powder. So still using it is nothing like you would use it in the 18th century, if that makes sense. Uh, the powder tax actually ended in 1869, and then we kind of see the resurgence of the push of hair powder. But in 1791, we have a little snippet here from uh, Mary Frampton. And you have to remember, this is the time when they were still paying taxes for the powder. And she said that she often saw one to two pounds of powder on the head or actually wasted in the room. And what that means, if you're familiar, if you've ever seen our powdering videos, especially our last one with the blue, the powder gets everywhere, just clouds and clouds of powder. And by the time you know it, you've gone through, you know, a couple pounds of powder. And also, in the 18th century, you would powder your hair 
uh, for the week, like the first day of the week, right? You powder your hair, and you would do that by starting in the back and separating, palmating, and then putting your powder on, brushing through it. And that was kind of the base powdering, as we call it. And then throughout the week, you would add more powder and pomatum, and soft or hard, depending on, you know, the style you were going for. And so you got a lot of layers of powder piled up. And so that's why you would take your fine tooth comb and you'd brush it and all the gunk would come out. But the amounts of powder that were actually used in the 18th century are just um, off the charts. When you think of 18th century tools for your hair powder, you have your, um, you have your shakers and you have your um, powder puffs. Now this is a reproduced um, container for your your powder, your hard palmatum, and your soft palmatum, and then your powder puff goes in there. And you also have your brushes and your combs, and you just you have all these tools at your disposal to like get the powder in. And that sort of changes in the 19th century. We start to just use our powder puffs, just just our powder puffs, nothing more, to put the dry shampoo in, even though it's still called hair powder at that time. And then. All of a sudden, by the 1930s, and this is going to be coming into the shop soon, this is a 1930s um, dry shampoo, the instructions say, this dry shampoo may be used with safety on a very oily scalp when hair has become too sticky to manage. They apply and rub vigorously into the roots of the hair. Leave on for 10 minutes, rub the scalp again, and shake the excess off. The hair must then be brushed with a stiff bristled brush until every trace of shampoo has vanished. And we do have stiff uh, bristle bore brushes, bore bristle brushes in the shop if you're looking for good powder brushes. But this is different. This you kind of just shake into your palm of your hand, you run it through, you get it really good in the scalp, you leave it on, you shake it off and you brush it out. Where in the 19th century, we were using our powder puffs. In the 18th century, we had all these different tools to get our powder in. So you can see kind of how it evolved and changed uh, throughout the time. When we talk about moving from the 18th century into the 19th century with hair powder, um, we need to remember that part of the reason it changed is because we had the powder tax. We had the revolution. You know, people really wanted to start over. They wanted a different change. They wanted more simplicity. So, so in come the Grecian styles and hair is a bit more natural. But you have to remember that we still didn't really have shampoos like we think of shampoos. So how are women, if they're not supposed to use powder or not going to use powder because of the tax, how are women gonna keep their hair clean? Well, the truth is, again, you're on either one side or the other. We start to see washes with egg washes coming in. We start to see simple washes with soap and water. And if you're not powdering your hair, a simple soap and water wash to actually wash your hair is perfectly fine. But then we still have people who are using powder and it's not just white powder, it's colored powder. So I have some numbers for you, okay? Just to show you that hair powder didn't end in the 18th century. It, it, it was used in a different way. So in London in 1820 with the hair powder tax, meaning that if you were gonna wear powder, if you were gonna wear powder in your hair, you had to pay a tax. Um, there was 29,199 people still using it in London, which is a fair amount. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty decent amount. Now, this is what I find interesting. In 1839, the number drops to 5,329 that are still paying uh, the tax to use the powder. Now, you have to remember, this is probably A, um, older people. B, this is probably people who use like color powder. Um, or people with very fine hair that need extra help. So there's a lot of reasons why you would still want to use hair powder in the 19th century. And instead of using white powder, it kind of changed. We always had color pulmonums. We talk about that in our other video, but we really start to see the use of colored powders. So you can't even really tell that people are using hair powder because it's in colored powder form. And so if you didn't want to go with the whole new idea of actually washing your hair with soap, you want to stick to the old idea, you could still do that. And people were doing that. I just want to make sure you guys understand that the use of hair powder did not end in the 18th century. People were still using it. And in fact, even though the numbers were dropping by 1839, uh, we still see hair powder receipts or recipes. So it's not like, it's not like people just stopped using it. And then in, in 1853, so we start to see a difference where in the 18th century, uh, powdered hair was big and um, that was a sign of healthy hair. You know, like you had a lot of hair, it was powdered, it was really pretty. 
Uh, but in the 19th century, we see this change to where shiny hair is very pretty. And so, you know, if you put powder in your hair, it's not going to necessarily be shiny. Now, that's different than our modern days because to us in the modern day, we see shiny hair as greasy hair, which isn't very attractive. So it's a different perception of um, the idea or the ideal look of the time. In 1853, in The Economist, it, there are still people using hair powder. And it talks about the annual duty that you would have to pay, the annual duty tax that you would have to pay if you were going to use uh, hair powder. And in respect of hair powder, used or worn by each person, an annual duty of one pound, five shillings, and ten pence was required per year. And then slowly after, it was actually repealed in uh, 1869. And we start to see the idea of bringing hair powder back, but we don't want to call it hair powder because we don't want to be really associated with um, the 18th century because we're trying to break away from that. You know, um, we don't want the women, we don't want the women looking as garish <laughs> as they did in the 18th century. We want, we want them very soft and very feminine and, um, you know, very natural next to no makeup. So we don't really want to talk about hair powder in, like they did in the 18th century. So we're gonna slowly change the name to dry shampoo. And we do see both names being used quite often in this time frame of like the 1850s um, on through to even like the early 1900s. We still see the, the name hair powder being used, but it's slowly trying to change into the name of dry shampoo. And you know, with this change, they are changing ingredients. So the ingredients now, even though you still have that same base of, of some sort of starch or some sort of absorbent, you know, it's got to absorb the oil. And most of the times it was starch, but like, you know, in the 1930s, corn flour became really popular. By the 20th century, we see sort of a change in uh, what they were using for the ingredients for hair powders. Now, so they were still using some of these in the, in the 19th century as well, but uh, we're still using starches and orris root. Uh, we're using talcs and rice powder and corn flour and derivatives of turpentine and soap and borax and just all kinds of different things that you wouldn't see in an 18th century recipe for hair powder. And so it kind of goes along with the new name of, um, we're sort of changing this to be called dry shampoo. We didn't really talk about um, the idea in the early 19th century of bathing. And before we sponge bathed in the 18th century, so like we bathed, we just didn't immerse ourselves. And um, Voltaire was actually, had a lot to say on this subject, but this was the first time in the 1800s that the idea of actually submersing yourself in water to clean became a thing. And we have this gentleman whose name was um, Saki Dean Mohammed. In Brighton, England, in 1814, he installed the very first steam bath. bath and get this, shampooing parlor. And so this was like the very first idea of, of what is shampooing. He actually called it shampoo, so it's C-H-A-M, P-O-O-I, and uh, we call it shampooing, but basically it was like the art of Indian massage of the head, and a lot of times his first shampoos consisted of oils, so it's not like, you know, we think of like a cleaning agent, it was oils, and this was very popular amongst you know, the newer kids or the, the younger um, populations. So in 1825, for the arts of preserving the hair, we see more recipes for um, powdering the hair for black and brown. And you know, like today for modern shampoo, modern dry shampoo, if you need a brown dry shampoo, you are going to probably use like co cocoa powder, right? I mean, that's what people use these days. But historically, it wasn't like that. You weren't using cocoa powder. If you wanted a dry shampoo or hair powder, depending on what, you, what label you like to put on it, it would not be cocoa powder. It would be like burnt sienna. It would be artist's pigments. That's how you color the powder. Um, you could also use herbs too, but most of the time we see pigments to color it. As we continue into the 50s, the 1850s, where we're still paying that powder tax, people are still using dry shampoo or hair powder to, ma to manage and clean their scalp because some just believe that this is, this is 
much better than like shampooing like we think of shampooing. And you're still paying your taxes. But by 1869, you know, this was repealed. So right away here we are in 1873, where this is the public opinion, <laughs> volume 24. And we have some readers here. And this is like one of the ways that the doctors um, and those who wrote the beauty books would push something to the women. They would get in these opinion books and they would write all kinds of articles and opinions about, you know, why something is better. So now they want to start pushing uh, the best shampoo, okay? So check this out. In October 18th, 1873, public opinion states that the best shampoo is Henderson's Original Dry Shampoo, which renders the hair and glands to the most vigorous and beautiful condition. So now they're trying to bring that back. And then uh, we do have some ads. I'm going to read them here for you. We have an 1873 ad, and this is from a farmer's magazine. And this is what I thought was so interesting about this. Because, you know, by this time we have a lot of, like, household books available and, like, how women should be acting and what they should be wearing and, and how to do their hair and things like that. We have a lot of those books available, but we don't really think of farmers. You know, what did the farmer's wives do? Well, you know, we can't say this is what all the farmer's wives did instead of like actually shampooing, but we can say that they were pushing the dry shampoo um, in the farmer's magazines. And here's a great example. This was a Parisian dry shampoo, um, and it was called like Comtesse Powdure, the French Parisian dry shampoo, and very elegant sounding. And it says, Invaluable for travelers, may be applied to the hair with a puff, and when shaken out, removes all the dust and oil. Used before curling the hair. So now the companies are trying to get in the idea, because curling the hair has become so important, that dry shampoo will help curl the hair as well. So here we go. It's recommended to be used at the seashore and aboard ships, where it will positively prevent damp, stringy looks, and its chief purpose is to make the hair light and fluffy, daintily perfumed with wood violet. And here, go, here we go again, with wood violet. Violet is a very popular scent for hair powder. But hair powder was scented with all kinds of stuff. Here is another one. This one comes from 1883. And this is very interesting. So in their push to push hair powder into dry shampoo, but also get into the idea of cleaning and curl setting and all that stuff <laughs> to um, be able to have it in the market along with these other products and still do okay. They wanted to invent categories for dry shampoo. They wanted to um, have like, this is bizarre, a wet shampoo, a, a wet dry shampoo and dry shampoos. And like it's all under dry shampoos. Just like we talked about the cold creams, but this is all labeled under dry shampoo, just different categories. And this was a category that didn't do so well. So um, this is from 1883, and it is called sea foam. Now, when you think of sea foam, you think of like foam on the sea, right? Well, you were supposed to put this on the scalp of your head, and it was supposed to foam. And it was supposed to clean all the oil and the salt and the, the ick out of your hair, and you're supposed to be able to brush it away. Um, the problem with this is that, A, it's not really a dry shampoo because it's liquid, but it's supposed to be a dry shampoo because you're not wetting your whole head. You're not dunking your whole head underwater. And this was the problem that a lot of people had was you were either, again, for or against, like, getting your whole head wet. Uh, is it better to get your head wet with warm water or cold water? And you could just go on and on for hours debating this. And they did in magazines and and um, various periodicals. So he said the receipt that was given in the druggist uh, previously was not satisfactory because it did not produce a foam when rubbed into the head while following the directions. What they said is here, we fixed it, here's a different recipe, but, it, but that we promise it will foam. Now this recipe is alcohol, water, water of ammonia, and cologne water. So I'm not really seeing where the foaming action <laughs> is coming in here. Um, but it's interesting, their reply says, the formula printed two months since was one supplied five or six years ago by a correspondent whom appeared to be a good authority. The same was afterwards republished several times by request of various inquirers. So they're saying that 
seafoam was like a really hot item for a while and everybody wanted the recipe. Nobody complained, but we took it for granted that the preparation was satisfactory, yet we are always willing to be set right. And so it's just very interesting how they're saying, you know, this, this recipe is going to be really good. It's going to fix it. We're really glad you wrote in. We didn't realize it was a bad recipe or it didn't really work, but hopefully it does now. But I'm sure it didn't really work. It was just one of those things. Seafoam, not, not the greatest idea for a dry shampoo. Okay, so now we have in, in the 1880s, we have this idea of hair powder. The book that I took this from is like an, it's called The New Handy Volume of American Encyclopedia. And it talks about what is hair powder. Uh, it's a white powder made from pulverizing starch scented with violets or other perfumes. Again, violet comes up quite often. It was one time largely used for powdering over the head. The strange fashion of using hair powder is said to have originated from some of the ballad singers at the Fair of Saint Germain in France, whitening their heads to render themselves more attractive. Um, in France, whitening became the fashion among several of the higher middle classes, ladies and gentlemen, to make the powder hold the hair, which was generally greased with pomade. So we're talking about the 18th century. We learned from a gentleman's magazine in November 1745 that 51 barbers were convicted before the commissioners of exercise at London and fined 20 pounds each for having in the keeping hair powder not made of starch, contrary to the Act of Parliament. And on the 27th of the same month, 49 others were fined for the like of for the like offense in the same penalty. In 1795, and the tax yielded 20,000 pounds a year, but had the effect of causing hair powder to fall into general disuse. The French Revolution, which overturned so many institutions, contributed also to the people of Europe returning to natural and unpowdered hair. When gentlemen first left off hair powder with cues, the custom of having hair cut short, which is quite universal at present, remember this is from 1880, then seemed then was deemed vulgar. At the present day, a powder continues to be used by some of the footmen of the nobility and higher ranking parts of their library, and occasionally the public or private for balls, costumes, and other ladies and gents who still prefer the old fashioned way. So they're saying in 1869, when the tax was repealed, um, only about 800 people were still paying for their, their hair powder. That is still quite a jump from, um, you know, no one using hair powder. So. It was definitely around. Here we go with another seafoam or dry shampoo recipe that somebody is complaining about in uh, 1884 that it doesn't work. And again, the magazine is saying, oh, well, try this. So um, what have we learned? Seafoam, not the greatest. So here we go, uh, 1909, and I will put this ad in the video where, again, here is another dry shampoo. So now we see definitely that switch between hair powder and dry shampoo. Uh, it's going to be referred to by 1900 as dry shampoo. They may use the name hair powder in the description, but it's dry shampoo now. So it says, why risk the cold every time you wash your hair? And then it shows this Gibson girl woman who's got this long, beautiful, fluffy hair. Like her hair is like this big. And it says dry and fluffy. And she's got this beautiful smile holding her locks of hair. It says the dry shampoo W&B Swedish hair powder cleanses the hair without washing, removes dust, grease, excessive oil after brushing, leaves hair soft, clean, and fluffy. Pretty much what they did in the 18th century, only now you're just using bits of it and you're brushing it all out because you wanted to absorb the grease and you're not like white like you were in the 18th century. And even white, we should probably talk about that, even white in the 18th century isn't white. So um, you see in movies a lot of times, especially older movies, when they had the hair powdered, it was like bright white. Well, that's not the case. If I put hair powder, white hair powder in right now, it's going to be um, probably like a reddish brown, you know, really light tan. It's not going to be white. Same thing with colored powders. You can't get a pink colored powder and expect that it's going to be bright pink. It all depends on your hair color. So. If you want the brightest pink hair powder, you're going to have to have bleached hair in order to get that. The blue hair powder looks amazing on uh, dark hair. And the pink hair powder looks amazing on either red hair, because it really reddens it up, or um, light hair, or, you know, like Marilyn Monroe bleach blonde. Um, now we're going to just jump into 1923 here, and we're going to see how the ingredients have really, really changed from that basic starch. So we have a dry shampoo here in 1923 where 
they have a coconut oil soap and they're going to shave it and powder it and they're going to combine it with borax. And so that is, <laughs> that is the basic hair powder, uh, one basic hair powder for a 1923 recipe where um, that has no starch in. Uh, um, you know where we say most hair powders, or most dry shampoos are made of starch. Well, that doesn't have any starch in. It's, it's soap and borax. And today now, now, we're trying to go back to the dry shampoo and a lot of people are. There's quite a lot of benefits for your hair for dry shampoo. I think a lot of people these days are looking at like sulfates in their shampoo and realizing that there's better ways to do it whether you decide to make a shampoo from um, apple cider vinegar or whether you do the dry shampoo or maybe combine a little bit of each. Um, I'm actually using our new 1930s dry shampoo in my hair. This is the third day now with it in. So um, it's probably going to go at least a day or so more before I wash it. And like my hair is pretty massive right now. It's, it's pretty awesome in the library. If you guys want to actually try this, hair powder and pomatum or 1930s hair powder. Um, we're actually working on quite a few recipes of different hair powders, different recipes throughout history. Uh, and, you know, feel free to check out our shop at www.littlebits.etsy.com. And we have 18th century hair powders, um, always modern and historical labels. You know, we have colored powders. This is a rose powder. Um, Jasmine, we have uh, jasmine, we have scented powders, we have blue hair powders, um, all sorts of different kinds of hair powders, and we're going to be adding more. Um, this is going to be up in the shop pretty soon, our 1930s hair powder. So you have a lot of options as far as historical hair care. Um, and now that you kind of get a better idea of how hair powder changed into dry shampoo and how it's kind of sort of similar, but by the 20th century, you know, most of the ingredients are kind of changed and they tried to combine the hair washing in with the dry shampoo and um, in with the hair powder. And it's a very interesting history. Um, uh, just know that in the early to mid uh, 1800s, you can still have powder. It would be colored powder, but you could have regular powder if you wanted. Recipes, advertisements, it's, they're all there. So, so this book is a formulary from 1931. And it says, oily hair, as a rule, is the result of mental strain. Sometimes people who are not nervous, but they are using their brains constantly without sufficient rest. And again, anemia or rundown system will cause this condition. When the hair becomes oily, the thought uppermost of the person's mind is to wash it. Washing does relieve it temporarily, but those with this condition who at first only wash their hair every two or three weeks will soon find that it is apparent needs of washing every week. The result is that if they will run their fingers through their hair to their scalp 24 hours after they have washed it, they will find the oil glands are overflowing worse than ever. They will also find that the ends of their hair have become very dry and brittle and split easily. This is because oil, which should normally flow through the center of the hair shafts, now comes out abnormally at the scalp and is not only wasted, but has a tendency to discolor the hair and make it fall out. The best remedies for this condition are dry shampoo and medicated astringents. One must be careful in the astringents that they, that they use do not contain too much alcohol, which would affect the average head of hair similar to water. Most people with oily hair fail to brush it enough to massage it or claiming that it makes it oilier than ever. This is a mistaken idea. The proper massage brings the blood to the surface, stimulates the circulation, feeds the roots, and splendid in combating oiliness. Now, if you think of our buddy who started the first ever shampoo parlor, this is kind of the same idea he was using, right? He was massaging with the, uh, the hands and with benefits to the head of the massage. So proper massage brings blood to the surface. Okay, brushing with long bristled flexible brush is also good. Where the hair is excessively oily, the bristles may be covered with cheesecloth at first to remove the excess oil. Brushing will not only stimulate circulation, but clear the hair and will also allow the scalp to breathe if properly done. Always brush upwards and forwards. So this is a really great example of how dry shampoo is still really important, especially for oily hair. Um, let's go to 1936. Let's see what they say for 1936. Okay, so here's a dry shampoo that is sodium bicarbonate, aluminum carbonate, sodium borate, terpenol, which is a derivative of turpentine, and then something I can't pronounce, an oil of bergamot. Um, so as you can see, they keep adding and adding and adding 
stuff into the dry shampoo. So it actually gets quite complicated and um, they're working to not only clean, but to help those with oily hair or, you know, help the scalp or help the hair follicles. And it gets really scientific. So by the early 40s, they've classified the types of hair into coarse hair, medium hair, and fine hair. Now they can actually make uh, dry shampoos and wet shampoos for specific types of hair. And so the idea of how this is all progressing, and it's getting really scientific now, the, the, the dry shampoo, which used to be just plain old hair powder, you know, uh, it's a very interesting history. And I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. And now you kind of have an idea about the history behind dry shampoo, hair powder, and how they're very, very similar. Um, they change throughout history but they also kind of combine in really interesting ways. I hope you enjoyed this today. Be looking for some of the new uh, historical hair powders from different time periods. Definitely um, give us a like and subscribe and all that stuff and share. Join us on our Facebook business page. This week we're going to be doing a live video. Our topic this week is going to be essences and extracts. We're going to take a look at a 1890s recipe book and eventually we're going to be making some uh, Belfast ginger ale, but we have to make the essences and the extracts first. So we're going to talk to you guys about that. You'll be able to make some to actually use in your own kitchen. So that should be a lot of fun. So thanks again for joining us and until next time, take care.